<coughs> yeah. So we live we live in a in a time that feels um, like new and different, and like we're on the cusp. I think Joe Biden said the other day that we we're we're living in times where um, we're moving from, from one. It feels like we're moving from one era to the next. So how do you handle that? Whether you agree with that, I don't know. But um, you know, we've been living in peace for a good hundred hundred years or so in um, in this part of Europe. Well, eighty years, I suppose. Relative prosperity, progress, like medical progress, definitely technological progress has been like explosive in the last hundred fifty years or so. Um, but why? Why is mental health problems um, as prevalent and big as they are now? Why do people still feel quite miserable, even when we live longer than, than people have for a long, long time? Uh, when we're more wealthy, so they say, my studies, study, studies this week, uh, the average person, even kind of the poorest among us, have more than the King of France would have done a few hundred years ago, uh, in terms of running water and kind of liquid assets and um, warmth and heat and job prospects and all those kind of things. I suppose not job prospects for the king, but um, we have an awful lot more wealth. The wealth curve, if you look at it, people, and until about uh, the, like the 17, late 1700s, uh, people lived on roughly the same amount of income from Jesus' day and before that um, to the 18th century, uh, 16th, no, it's 18th century. And then all of a sudden, with the Industrial Revolution, the curve of like GDP, basically, of like household income, just goes up and up and up and up and up. And now we're kind of far up here, and we're extremely wealthy, but struggling. So this is what WH Auden's poem. It's written September, it's called September the 1st, 1939. So the beginning of the Second World War. And you can kind of feel the adventy atmosphere of Auden's poem. And the question that we're trying to answer is, how did we get to where we are today? and what? Do we do about it? How do we live as faithful Christians today? So he, he writes this. I sit in one of the dives on 52nd Street. He's a Brit, but he's in New York, I think, at this time writing. Uncertain and afraid, as the clever hopes expire of a low, dishonest decade. Waves of anger and fear circulate over the bright and darkened lands of the earth, obsessing our private lives. The unmentionable odour of death offends the September night. Accurate scholarship can unearth the accurate scholarship can unearth the whole offence from Luther until now that has driven a culture mad. Find what occurred at Linz, what, hu uh, what huge imago made, a psychopathic god. I and the public know what all the school children learn. Those to whom evil is done do evil in return. Um, Linz was Hitler's birthplace and apparently he had a very brutal father. And, and so he's making the point that like, how do we expect him to be a kind man? when he comes from a culture with Luther in the background, with a horrendous father, a warlike Germanic culture. Um, so all school children learn, those to whom evil is done do evil in return. Into this neutral earth, where blind skyscrapers use their full height to proclaim the strength of collective man, each language pours its vain competitive excuse. But who can live for long in a euphoric dream? Out of the mirror they stare, imperialism's face and the international wrong. Faces along the bar, this is the famous verse. Faces along the bar cling to their average day. The lights must never go out. The music must always play. All the conventions conspire to make this fort assume the furniture of home, lest we should see who we are. Lost in a haunted wood, children afraid of the night who have never been happy or good. It goes on a little bit more. It's kind of a depressing poem. Um, but if you were to try and tell a story, let's talk about this with each other and our lips to Lou. Um, if we could tell a story of how we got from Luther happily, joyfully restoring the good news of the gospel to Europe from like explosions of what we were talking about last time, explosions of um, enthusiasm for reading the Bible, for Christ, for forgiveness, for grace. We finished last time with the sweet dropper, the guy called Richard Sibbs. And the Puritans who just preached up a storm everywhere they went, left established churches, started things. There was great freedom in part. But when there wasn't like freedom from the state, there was great freedom in the gospel. And there were people seemed to be loving living under grace and no longer under um, the kind of Latin laws of strange Catholic stuff. 
Um, so how do we go from happy reformation, the future is in our hands, to the most bloody century, 20th century, uh, where, I'm not sure quite how they worked this out, but apparently, by quite a distant, easy margin, more people were killed, more people suffered violent deaths in the 20th century than all other centuries that we know of combined. Uh, so how do we get there? From happy reformation, <laughs> the future's bright and freedom is in our own hands to today. How would you try and tell that story? Because there's an awful lot I, uh, that you could say. We'll just try and tap a few things tonight. But let me nip the loo and then you can tell me the answer when I get back. Fighting, that's all I can think of. It's like, it's no longer, I can't even remember, but it's no longer the non Christians versus the Christians. It's the, oh, well, we take a slightly different view on this to you, and so how dare we be together? Mm -hmm. I imagine that would, no, that is divisive, isn't it? Post Reformation, it's like we agreed to be reformed, but then it's like, no, we're the first Ammon for a church, and we're the second Ammon for a church, and so can't possibly be together. Pondered this when you said um, about that French king having less than the poor of today. In what way? Well, he said, would you. No, no, as in what way did you find it strange? Well, I, I find. I still thought they had all sorts of gold and riches. <coughs> they didn't have things that we would consider. Like beans. running water. Like yeah, they didn't have those sort of things. And they didn't make those sort of things. Yeah. That's true. That sort of thing. I think rather yeah. that the ability to go out and purchase whatever was materially around. I think the King of France probably had quite a lot. Like, and annoyed people because he had so much. Yeah. Yeah. Had so much. Yeah. Yeah, it was literally who in the street. I think it's because... Uh, there is on my drive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's because basically the Lord of the Flies was played out on a continental scale, really. The like, authority was removed and it's sort of put into the hands of every person. And every person is not responsible enough to have that authority. And so we massacred each other. So, In, and, like from a theological or like a ecclesiastical, like churchy sort of direction, like you're saying, first amphitheater, church, second amphitheater, church, etc. If Luther kind of goes, oh, no, 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 the truth is, and we agree with him, the truth is what the Bible says, and how do we know what the Bible says? Because we've got brains and we can read it, and we can figure it out for ourselves, and I can argue with you about it. But that led to everyone just disagreeing over everything, um, rather than trusting authority, what was handed down, <clears throat> and rightfully distrusting authority, because it had gone absolutely skew -if. But all of a sudden, it's just in your lap. Mm. And if anybody disagrees with you, then they are definitely wrong and dangerous. Mm. I don't know. You've got a pretty, pretty bleak view of humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts? What would you put in the story of how we got to today and why things are the way they are here in the West? Just the stuff, like humans tend towards chaos, don't they? Okay. So, I don't know, just in any kind of scheme. Yeah. You're gonna, the bigger, it's easy when it's like two people, isn't it, to get along. But then as soon as you're trying to, like you said, lead larger groups, or mm. lead a church, or school of thought, or whatever. Mm. And then you add into that, like the sinful, selfish nature of people. Yeah. It just tends towards well, chaos really, yeah, and hurt and all the rest of it that comes yeah. from that. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that's true. Mary Ann, did you have any thoughts on where we are at the moment? You could, I, I think, you could put in 
Okay. You can say. Oh, I was going to say, depending on your point of view, it's like yeah. the fall of Rome again, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, there are parallels. Yeah. What kind of parallels would you, would, would people be pointing out between us and the fall of Rome? Um, art. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so but you could do it so yeah, many different yeah. ways. Yeah. Art, gender, sexuality. Okay. All of those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. So moving from like a fairly structured society to a place where there's loads of freedom, but with that comes yes. quite a lot of chaos. Right. Too yeah. much freedom, and then instead of having one person, everybody hates. Everybody hates everybody. Yeah. But, but that sounds like an argument for, you know, the Catholic Church and tradition yeah. and, yeah. 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 Which, uh, or which the people, Orthodox Church, I should say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is not lost on Catholics, I think. Um, so this is an interesting book. It's called The Last Christian on Earth. Um, and it's a little, you can borrow it if you like. It's, it's a little bit like the Screwtip letters and it's sort of written from the other side and you're supposed to be reading it as like an insight into what the devil's, what the devil's doing. So he's kind of tells the story, it takes a minute to get into the, into the idea of it. You can have a look at it later, don't want to talk about it too much, but he, basically what he's looking at is the grave digger thesis. Have you come across the grave digger thesis? Which is that Protestantism seems really successful at the beginning, but in everything that happens, with Luther and Calvin and co at the beginning, um, we, they actually sow the seeds of Christianity's just destruction. So that w why, why do we see so many churches built here? Well, Christianity is the answer. That, like, Christianity used to just run everything. Like, people, everyone was in church uh, at some point. I was, I was in a meeting the other day with a guy who's a pastor in Tonopandi, which is a village up in the Rondo, or a town. 8,000 people in the town. And if you count up the chapels and the number of seats in the chapels, there are 8,000, roughly 8,000 seats in the chapels that there were in town. Which means at some point, the, the, the entire population of the town on a Sunday morning and evening probably, and afternoon and everywhere in between, would be getting into church and attending, like everybody in the town. Um, so Christianity seems to like be in the water. And, of not just our history but of time today but the great digger thesis is that protestantism sowed the seeds of christianity's de decay and destruction in the end particularly something like individualism um, or like authority so before when you had the catholic church in the medieval time uh, people were ruled in like a feudal kind of way remember that from school like the triangle thing so you've got the king and then the lords and then the barons which are the way around it goes and then the knights, and then the husband, the plebs. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, the husband, <laughs> and then the wife and the children, and the, you know the serfs and the regular people. And within families, yeah, there's a hierarchy. Within a town, there's a hierarchy. Within the nation, there's a hierarchy, and God is at the top of it. And so we all sort of know our place. And there are plenty of people who kick against that. But what Protestants do is come along, and um, and and eventually something that Martin Luther does. Uh, is like split the civil authorities from the religious authorities. Um, well, well, it sort of starts with Martin Luther's ideas, but then it, it gets worked out later on because after the Reformation time, there's lots of wars in Europe. So you can go and look at like late 15th century, 16th century, no, late 1500s, 1600s. There's just lots of wars of religion between different city states. Uh, some are Catholic, some are Protestant. There's brutal massacres, like people like the Huguenots in France. You've come across or heard of them before. They were real solid Protestant people who Calvin in Switzerland helped to support, to support and encourage, sent lots of missionaries to France. But where are all the Protestant churches in France today? The answer is there are very, almost none, still you know, hundreds of years later, because they did an extremely good job of exterminating the Huguenots, who were the French Protestants, um, because France was like a Catholic land and Germany was sort of split, Germany was sort of split into different places. So there's loads and loads of wars of of religion and eventually um, people work out or move towards a, um, a way of often quite brutally splitting apart church and state splitting apart christian authorities and civil authorities um, to the point where the church is now no longer at the top of the tree I mean, it used to be for example that your kings had to bow to what the pope says so you remember henry the eighth well, if he wants to divorce his wife he doesn't just do it, but he has to write a letter to the Pope and feels like 
everybody just assumes that it's right, that he has to write a letter to the Pope and get it signed off by the religious authorities because the Pope is over any king. And that after the Reformation times, we get split up. And so we begin to, to have like the beginnings of Christianity being, or any religion being shoved into the private box. And what we're really trying to do out here in the public sphere is um, is live in a way together that doesn't have any religion involved, which is impossible uh, when you think about it, because everybody has values. Uh, but it sort of does make peace for a while. And America is the best example of that, isn't it? So Amer the Americans take the values of Christianity, like we hold this truth to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Um, take, those, take that kind of idea, which is actually a Christian idea, because if you think, think about it, this is something Glenn Scrivener says, nobody's really equal. Like if we were to do maths tests, a maths test now in this room, Cheryl would probably mm -hmm. slay us all of that. Uh, if, and so we're not equal in maths. If we were to do a test on the planets and physics and that kind of thing, Sammy would come out on top probably. If we were to do a coding thing, I would have no idea, maybe we would dominate. Um, we could have a running race, there'd probably be a big disparity. We could have a lifting weights race, there'd be a very big disparity. Um, we're, not, we're just not equal to each other. So it isn't self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh, in fact, it seems more self-evident that, that nobody's equal with each other. So why do we think, why do the Americans think that everyone should be equal in this land? Um, at least in theory, you know, they have lots of slaves in the back garden, but why do they think that people are equal or say that people are equal is because they've inherited lots of views from Christianity. Does that make sense? Um, so they've inherited a lot of Christian stuff, but Protestants have made it possible to split the church and state so that the Americans now have Christian values in the public square, but they just call them self-evident. They just call them like obvious beliefs that everyone has, obviously, um, and they don't have to mention anything about Christianity to like to make those beliefs make sense. Does that make sense? So, so now we have a world where Christianity is a private thing. Um, and in a public square, we try to avoid God and all that. Pub politicians are pretty obvious about that. If anybody ever, even in America now, says that God has told them something, or you know, they were praying and, and trying to make this decision, we just get rinsed and mocked mercilessly. Um, so that's one thing that happens with Protestantism. Another one is like, uh, individualism. So this is your authority point. Is that, that if we don't have to just turn up at mass and believe what the priest over there is saying is going to save us, if we now have the privilege of having the Bibles in our own homes or in our own churches in our own language, then now my religion is my business and like it's my responsibility and we would see the joy of that right like a personal relationship with god knowing my own life changed being able to read the bible in my own language what an amazing privilege but can you see also there's like the seeds of individual that's individualism that's beginning to bust down those hierarchies so if the king of england doesn't have to listen to what the pope says anymore he can sort of begin to write his own laws and then if i go along and i read the bible and it in my own language contradicts what the priest said on sunday then who's in charge now? It's like the scripture with me. Um, but we've, we've begun to erode the like corporate um, hierarchy of they're in charge and they tell me what to do and they tell me what to believe. And I sort of just go along with them. Now everybody's in charge of their own heart, which is a New Testament thing, right? That, um, that men and women and slaves and free and children and old people and black and white and every people of every time tribe and nation everyone's known by name he knows the hairs in your heads um, he's got your name on that name you know the name place written in heaven your your name is written on his heart written on his hands in the Lamb's book of life so that there's obviously like personal individual stuff in the christian life and now we've dismantled or moved away from the catholic church because of a conscience thing the genie's out of the bottle and now everybody can do that and so fast forward a few hundred years and Catholic people would say, Osgenes has, written... has written a book about the great Greek thesis, that it's all wonderful in the first couple of centuries, but you can see how Protestantism has actually started to
to become maybe an acid that's beginning to destroy our whole culture. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can kind of see how that is sort of true, I think, um, in some ways. So we'll think about a little bit, just do some discussion, with a man called Blaise Pascal. So he's like a, one of the like, turning point people at the end of the Reformation times before the modern times. He's like one of those guys who stands in the middle. He's like the last piece of the Reformation that we should think about, who lives towards the age um, that in France, he's a Frenchman, who he, he's living in the age of like uh, everybody going to card games constantly all the time in aristocratic France. Right? Like the, the age, the century that ends up um, brutalizing and like, winding up the peasants of France so badly that they end up revolting and end up chopping off everybody's heads in the late 1700s. Um, so, so he's writing as a Christian, uh, as a Catholic, but he was part of and friends with a Catholic group who were actually very Reformation in their beliefs. So they believed in like grace through faith, um, not just grace, you know, God's help to make you a better person, but by tr they believed in like trusting in Christ. They were trying to reform the Catholic Church from the inside. And obviously, like, publicly talked a lot against Luther's theology, but basically had Luther and Calvin's theology, and were trying to bring it into the Catholic Church. And they got beaten by um, the people who was, they're called the Jansenists, uh, or Jansenists. He was involved with those guys, or at least liked their stuff. They got beaten eventually by the Jesuits. And you've probably heard of the Jesuits. Big group in Catholic world that were like, uh, that ended up winning out against the more Reformation, kind of, we would say, Biblical grace alone, um, like going to scripture, having a personal relationship with God, Jansenists. But so he's one of them. So he, I think we can claim him as like a good, solid Christian who uh, was actually very Augustinian in his background. So we'll think about that in a second. But this is one of his famous quotes. Um, I want us to think about it. So he's living in a world where he's he's a wealthier man. He's mixing in cultural circles where people are distracting themselves constantly all the time like they're, they're dressing up in crazy you know extremely posh fancy clothes they're going to card games and balls and dinners and hunts and anything like that that you can just imagine wealthy french aristocrats doing in that era he's in those circles and and he says he notices people going from one card game and when as soon as they finish that they go to the ball and as soon as they finish the ball they go to somebody else has to play bridge or whatever they play and they go to the next place and then they go to bed and they get up and they just do it all over again. And they don't work or do anything like that. They're wealthy beyond your wildest dreams, um, at least in that culture's time. And so he says, he just notices or like is wondering, why are they entertaining themselves all the time? And this is one of his conclusions. He says, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. So these people seem to not be able to just sit quietly with themselves. He reckons there's a reason underneath all of the distraction and entertainment and like diversion. Um, and this is his reason, that they just can't sit on their, on their own in silence. Um, so let's ch chat with the folks next to us. Do you think that's right? Like is, he, is he correct? And is that correct for our own day? And if so, why do we find it so difficult to be on our own silent? Well, maybe not us, maybe we like meditation and that kind of thing. But people in our culture, is that true of them? And if so, why do we find it so difficult to switch off the phone, switch off the TV, and just have a, a day without some kind of noise? Why do we find that so difficult? Should we, should we just all chat together? You have to talk now, so I don't talk to <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, I was thinking about this the other day as well, but like, Whenever you're in the car or something like that, you always have to put, oh, well, I do, sorry, I can't just put something, I always got to put music on or a podcast on or something like that. Hmm. Or if I go out for a run, I got to put music yeah. on or a podcast on my ears, I can't just have. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Um, not wanting to be alone with their thoughts. Right. Mm. Do we find that? Uh, I'm, I'm similar with that. I'd like to have music on a lot in the background. 
What is it that you think about, like if you were alone with your thoughts? Where would it go? All over the place. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If, you, you, if you're sitting on your own, you don't want to do something, or listen to something, or watch mm. something, or not just sit. Mm. But when you go to sit to pray and read your Bible, then I often go to just sit for quite a while then. Mm. Yeah. But I don't, I don't mean to, okay. but it happens. Yeah. And do you find that good? restorative helpful quiet time yeah okay. it's funny that like even to think about rest being rested and restored mm. yeah we sort of live in a world where you have to do something to, yeah. to have that then like yeah watch some tv oh, I, I really want to really chill rest. this so, afternoon so i'm gonna just sit and watch tv or I'm going to go to the spa right. to have a hot tail out of really lush. Yeah, oh, nice. yeah um, but we kind of think of, I, well, the way I was thinking of it was that I want the time to be productive. Or yeah. what, at least not even productive, because like, there's nothing productive about me listening to music or most of the podcasts I listen to at all. But to be able to say, oh, like, in this time, this happened, you know, like, filling in the time sheet or whatever, this is what was happening. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's solitude and s silence isn't yeah. modelled to us at all now, is it? No. Um, and I imagine in every generation, mm -hmm. there's always people that it's not, but especially now, that like you never, there's always something demanding your attention or yeah. and you know like children etc always have it. Yeah. But there's so much more than that. Yeah. And the world makes you feel bad if maybe not directly, but it's like you're missing out if you miss whatever mm. via social media or T V or even yeah. in town or while well, you weren't there. Yeah. Know, there's something whereas before it would be you know like places like you have to go physically go to like Fal the Bread and to get away from yeah. the habit of life. Yeah. Whereas before, you could go and up the same yeah. old seats mm. if you wanted to just walk in off the street. Yeah. Spend some time in quiet solitude and reflection. Yeah. Whereas now things like that are closed. Yeah. yeah. And people don't think to do that. No. And maybe we wouldn't want to do it. No. Yeah. I think just in addition to what you're saying, Paul, is that we not there's not only things demanding our attention, but we want to give our attention mm. away, and I think that's basically the <coughs> blaze is not to say. Yeah. That's not getting any closer to giving us the answer of why. Mm. Like we, if you like, the market for attention, attention grabbing stuff is there because yeah. we're so desperate for our attention to be grabbed by something. Mm -hmm. it's like being scared of the dark, isn't it? You're not sure what you're scared of, but you just don't want to have to face it. Yeah. It's like the opposite, isn't it? Of be still and know that I'm God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And okay, so we're. We need to put in a little bit of like his history. So our cool picture at the beginning of these BOD men. Uh, this is the picture that comes up first. It's a famous painting. It's like illustrates the enlightenment. Um, can you see the different things that are on the table? What's that funny machine? I don't know. It's I took a technology. picture of it to zoom in and it still wouldn't work it out. Like a Morse called E. Yeah. yeah. It's probably it's telegram telegram telegram. receipts. And those long string things coming off yeah. of um, That could be a telegram thing. Mm -hmm. Theatre electrics. Yeah. I don't know, there's a gun down here. Um, there's they another, have another uh, machine uh, on the back, right? So? There's another machine on the back, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Behind those, those guys over there. Uh, so the Enlightenment happened, begins to happen around the, like Pascal's time and onwards for like the next couple of centuries. They call it the, like the long 18th century. Um, it stretches back a little bit. Which is, again, kicked off in Protestant times. And, and I guess there's always been some kind of atheism around in the world, you know, from Bible times. The fool says in his heart, there's no God. That's kind of part of what we're like. But the enlightenment happens, what Sam used to be talking about, authority. Um, it seems to be something that, uh, that's like rooted in Christianity, rooted in Protestantism, like getting rid of the authorities or coming out from under the shadow of the authorities of the Pope and of the history and just putting ourselves under, under the authority of scripture. 
um, now you get a lot, a lot of technological advances, a lot of, um, well, just philosophers like a guy called Rousseau comes around or Immanuel Kant, um, I've heard those names. And what they begin to do is, uh, Darwin is around this period, this period as well. What they begin to do is try and explain the world um, without any authorities at all, which means without God and just from a human perspective. Um, so you can, you can try and explain the, the, the uh, enlightenment in lots of different ways. But just think about the word like enlightenment. What they're trying to do, the, the story goes, it's in, the, in those period that they invent the name of like the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages um, for what we looked at last time, for the, like the medieval time. Because uh, it comes from actually from a Christian author who says, uh, the, the, like the early church, those were the good and bright ages. And then we had the medieval times with the Catholic Church, and that was a bit dark and, you know, and horrid. And then with the Reformation, we came to the light again, and now we're making progress into the future. And this atheist uh, historian, I can't remember what his name is, but he picks up the same kind of way of thinking. So it was all good, and then it went bad, and now we're progressing towards happiness again. He picks up that, and he goes, oh, but actually, Christianity is the problem. And he writes like an atheist's history of humanity. I can't remember his name. But he picks up that shape of thinking, like the U curve, and he says, well, he just zooms it out a little bit and says, look, the Romans and the Greeks, they really knew what civilization was. They really had a good time. They really were at the height of philosophy, the height of art, and the height of all these things. And what we need to do is realize, what was it that brought the Dark Ages? Christianity. Christianity was the thing that, that made the Roman Empire uh, crumble into dust. Christianity was the thing that gave us the brutality of of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Christianity was the thing that's given us um, uh, the, the wars of religion around Europe that were really brutal, you know, after Luther and co, that have given us po-faced, nasty people like John Calvin, who tried to make everyone follow his, his religious rules, or the nasty Puritans who tried to ban Christmas and did ban Christmas for a while. Um, and so you see Christian, Christians are the problem. And now what we've got to do is free ourselves from the shackles of priests and rules and Bible authorities. And what we need to do is be humans. And so um, we have our future in our own hands. Our future is bright. If we just forget about authorities and go with our scientific methods, like go with a, an understanding of truth that comes from what you could see in your senses, basically. And that's like, some people would call it modernity. It was like an enlightenment thing that the only thing we can know is true. Someone like Francis Bacon, or like the, um, the early days of um, like Darwin and people like that, uh, would, would talk about the only thing that you know is true is, the, is the, like the information of your senses. So if you, if you can't measure it, you can't see it, taste, touch it, then it's not there, it's not really real. And so science explodes and technology grows um, and you get things like, well, not just the printing press, but then not too long after that, a couple of hundred years later, like the late 1700s, um, steam power and lots of coal in Britain and the Industrial Revolution soon kicks off. And so it really does seem like it's coming true, doesn't it? Like that story of progress, like we've thrown off the shackles of believing in God. Now we believe in the power of human ingenuity um, and the power of like human reason, the power of human... Uh, slicing and dicing and like putting the world into all of its categories like Darwin would do in the natural world, like different scientists would do in other things. Um, and we're, we're not gonna just take what the church spoon feeds us anymore. We're gonna go and find out what the world is really like. So you get the age of discovery, the age of uh, like exploration, the, the age of industry and like the power is really growing, um, as in steam power is really growing. Human power over nature seems to be growing because before long, we start to get anesthetics and antiseptics and all those kind of things, and, and life expectancy goes up, and everybody's getting wealthier, even the poorest people who work in the factories, they now actually have some kind of quality of life. They're not just living into their 30s in the fields, but they're living into their 40s maybe in, in the slums. But at least it's a little bit better than being you know, peasants. And so it seems like that story is actually coming true. Does that make sense? That's just the point that I'm making, is, um, that there seems to be a lot of progress and that that progress seems to have come by us getting rid of God and saying, we don't need your authority anymore. 
What we need is to trust human ingenuity, to look inside ourselves and be who we can be. Uh, and so you get somebody like, well, you get poems like William Blake, uh, who was actually a Christian. <laughs> um, so, uh, but he's kind of summing up the, um, like the mood of the times with this, this poem, which is called The Garden of Love. It goes like this. I went to the garden of love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. So it's like throwback to childhood, used to play in a beautiful garden. And he goes back to it as an adult and what's there? A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of the chapel were shut and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore. And I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be. And priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. So can you feel the mood? Like, we've got to get rid of God. All that those religious people do is come along to our beautiful gardens where we used to enjoy such um, joys and innocent pleasures as children, you know, as, as adults, whatever, whatever you want to read into that. And what do they do? They build their chapels right in the middle of our farm. And then they shut the doors of the chapel, and shut the doors to us, to the doors to grace, with all their commandments. And all the priests end up doing is wearing black and walking around, binding up people's joys and happiness and wrecking the gardens and squashing the flowers. Um, so you can feel like, of course, we want to get rid of and get, get away from the authorities of the church who squashed our lives and bring us to freedom. And so who do we look to? We look to the scientists, we look to the doctors, we look to the people who are freeing us from, um, from all that old uh, superstition and bringing us into an age of enlightenment. Right, can you see the story? Mm. We'll like, read it on the curve. It used to be great in the days of Romans and Greeks. And then the Christians ruined everything. And now we're bringing it back. We're getting rid of God once and for all. We can live as humanity and be happy ever after. And then you get to the 20th, 20th century when the technology and the machines and the, in so many different ways, like machine guns, horrible chemical weapons, eventually nuclear weapons, or you could think of it in like biological technology. So um, people were really, really into like very modern, forward-looking, morally quite good people were really into eugenics in the beginning of the 20th century. You know, eugenics, which is getting, is like tweaking the gene pool, making sure that we that we get rid of the people who have diseases and the unto mention, you know, the people that we don't really want breeding in society. And we just make sure that humanity grows to its full potential by making sure the right people are breeding with each other. And we think of that and it makes our skin crawl, it makes you want to be sick because we live at this end of the 20th century and we all learned about Nazi Germany and, um, and that kind of thing. But you just have to wind back 100 years and everybody was into it, thought it was a good idea, because it's technology, right? Technology and progress, and um, of course, humanity's destiny is like in our own hands. We don't need God to tell us what to do. He's given us everything we need. So what we need is science, progress, the greatest minds working on the questions, and, um, and then it goes very, very dark. The, second, the First World War traumatizes everyone, um, and everyone gets depressed and writes poems like W.H. Auden when the Second World War comes back. And they told us the first one was the war to end all wars, and the second one comes along. Um, and it's even worse than the first one. And it's actually a world war, not just a European war that you know, ships in soldiers from the, from the colonies. It's actually a war all, the, all around the world. And it's horrendous, and it lasts for years, and everybody dies. Um, and even after that, what's happening in the Soviet Union? Like 100, 110 million? Solzhenitsyn says 110 million people died because of what the communists did which is, I thought, Nazi Germany is almost nothing compared to that. And it just doesn't seem to stop um, through those first decades of the, of the 20th century. Um, and so we get to where we are today, but like, people call it post-modernity, or like even now post-post-modernity, where we don't really know what we should do anymore. Uh, and we just distract ourselves with entertainment. And we're right back to Blaise Pascal, 400 years ago, where, where people were so wealthy and had no worries that they ended up worrying about death. That's basically what Pascal says. It's like, when you're alone with your thoughts and God is now out of the picture, all you have is the constant march of time. 
Like if you're not a peasant who's basically busy all the time and worried about your work, if you are now wealthy and don't really have that many worries and you're quite healthy, you've got lots of peasants to do your work for you, then what is it that you spend your time doing? Well, you spend your time alone in the quiet, thinking about your own impending death, but without any hope because there's no God in the world and you've made the whole world flat and dark. Um, and so what do we have to do? We have to go get some entertainment in and go to the ball and then the card game and then the, the hunt and the ball and the card game and the hunt. We have to do it or else our misery will get to us. Um, and I, I think we're in a fairly similar place today, except we just have much more efficient entertainments that are quite cheap that everyone can have in the supercomputer that they have in their pocket. Um, okay. So this is one way you can think about like how have we got to where we are at the moment. Uh, and we'll talk about the last one because it's a little interesting one as well. Um, so people have uh, been saying like, over the last few decades um, that we're in a bit of a weird time in world history where people are very different and think very differently to, um, to how people used to think or how people think in cultures that are different from us here in the West. And so this is a, a good little acronym which spells see, weirder, um, which comes from this book called Remaking the World by Andrew Wilson. <coughs> um, so there's a few other people who kind of picked up the like weird acronym to describe what people like us are like. And then Andrew Wilson just adds the two, the E and the R on the end of them. But let me try and work through it. Um, and then we'll think a little bit about where the church is in all this. So we are Western now, which means like we're, we're part of a globalized world. So we don't just come from our particular town in your particular country with a kind of small circle of influence and a small circle of family and a small circle of where you would go in your life you know, because we have horses and carts. Now we have airplanes and, and trains and automobiles and the internet and you can Google Earth anywhere on the other side of the world and almost walk around it. And so we're, we now come from the West and the West is something that's connected to, to the whole of the world. Um, so globalization, we're Western. We're educated. Um, we're kind of post-enlightenment people. We're people who have sort of ingrained into us that what's really real is what you can learn in school. It's your mathematics, it's your science stuff that you can test and taste and see and all of that kind of thing. It's sort of ingrained in us that there's a division between spiritual stuff up there and real life that's down here. Right? It's something that we can't quite get away from. It's like uh, it's in the foundations of like, the, the way that we think as Western people. Um, so we're we're educated. Religion is something that's like up there and contestable. And science is the stuff, you know, the solid realities around us, those are the things that really matter and, and make sense, like uh, money and getting a job. Um, church is something that you just do on Sundays. We're also industrialized, which means that um, we have a lot of machines around us. And that's quite, a, that's quite a deep one you can think about. But uh, we press buttons to make things happen. And then now almost find it impossible to escape from the idea uh, the idea that when we have a problem, we can just press a button, take a pill, find a solution to, a, to the problem. And we almost think of our world as like a world of cogs and machines, um, of software and hardware. We talk about our brains being wired in a certain way. We think about our bodies as like, if Instagram is basically like this. If I just did this, then I would have that outcome. If I just did that many reps, we have these wonderful things, supercomputers on our, what, on our wrists now count your heartbeats, they count your temperature, they count your everything. So that whenever you're going for a walk, you're optimizing yourself. You've like become part of the machine. Um, and we think of our, of our lives like that. And we have almost no rest from it uh, because we're industrialized. We, we don't just work in the quiet fields, uh, scratching a living from the earth anymore, relying on each other, going through the seasons of you know, hard times in the winter, longing for springtime. Um, having to eke out the cabbage that we pickled from like months ago to get through it and we're all skiddy and then finally in the springtime we have some meat to eat and we can slaughter a pig. We don't do that anymore. We just eat the same like, menu every week because it gets flown in from all around the world because we're Western, and we're industrialized and we're also incredibly wealthy, which we talked about before. Even the poor among us compared to people in, in other centuries are fabulously wealthy. Um, and so we can fix a lot of our own problems 
we don't so much have to pray like a George Muller kind of thing. We, we know where our next meal is coming from because we have paychecks and social security and um, food banks, those kind of things where we're almost like a God to each other. You don't really need to pray for your own provision because we're, we're pretty wealthy and we can fix a lot of our own problems. So we're rich, which isn't true in, in the rest of the world, uh, which means we don't need to share so much, which means we're, we can be as individuals as we want to be. We don't have to rely on our families because we have enough money and can just be looked after by the government or by, by society rather than by my family. So we're quite weird in that, and, and that's partly because we're rich. We're also democratic. Uh, we don't listen to the king anymore. The king is just the guy who wears funny clothes. And, you know, some people feel sentimental about him. Many people don't feel the opposite. But he doesn't really have the power. We elect a king every now and again, and then we just kick them out. We can say what we want about that king. Generally speaking, if we all agree on something, enough of us agree on it, we can go and get it done. Um, uh, so our households have become a lot more like that. Um, so it can be quite difficult to think of a God who rules by decree, or a God who doesn't just do what we think is best. You know, because me and my culture think this is how it should go. It feels very odd to us that God would disagree with that, or that he would cut against what the majority opinion is, because surely that it's just said itself evidently right and how it should go. And so now, in the age that we live in, we're ex-Christian, in that we're, we've gone from pagan paganism to Christendom. Uh, so like Greeks and Romans who didn't know anything about Christ, mostly, who were then Christianized, or us, you know, pagan Welsh people in the West, Irish, wherever we've come from, people who believed in multiple different gods and all sorts of different weird spiritual things who've now been Christianized into believing that there's one God who's, who's you know, the Father who sent the Son by the Spirit. And, and now we're in a weird, like, new era after Christendom, which hasn't really happened before in the world, because there's lots of places in the world that are still quite pagan, you know, people who live in tribes and India and lots of other religions around the world uh, who aren't yet Christian, but there hasn't really been a culture or a place in the world where people have moved on from Christianity before because uh, it's been in our water for like several thousand years. So, so what we're doing now, Glenn Scrivener describes it as like um, trying, to, um, trying to take the foundations out of the castle that's been built. So the castle is up in the sky and we've been trying to nibble away at the foundations and say we can still have all the values of Christianity. We can still say that everybody's equal. We can still say that uh, the, the strong shouldn't eat the weak, but you know, we should look after weak people. We, should, we can still say that... Um, other, other Christian values that people depend upon. Um, that like a personal freedom of conscience is something that shouldn't be violated. Things like that, which we should think are just obvious Western values, are actually Christian values. We're, we're made in the image of God, that's why everyone's equal, even though we're not actually equal in what we can do. We're equal because we're made before God. Why should we not just crush the poor? You know, because that's what happens in the wild, that's what Darwin found out. Why not? Well, because Christ. Because Christ comes and serves the poor, and God is the one who looks after the widow and the orphan. That's why we've grown up in a culture that eventually has got round to doing that for slaves with Wilberforce, or for, a, for an NHS with, um, what was his name, Lloyd? Naren Bevan. Naren Bevan, son of a preacher now. Um, those are like Christian values that we should look after the poor, that people's freedom of conscience shouldn't be just ridden over. It's, that's a Christian value. And what, we're, what we've begun to do is try and live by those values, but take the foundations away. Another way of putting it is that we want the kingdom, but without the king. Um, we want to live in, a, in Jesus's reality, where the poor are fed, the hungry are looked after, the sick are cared for. Um, there's justice and peace, and people love one another, and there's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. We want to live in a culture like that, but we don't want the king of that kingdom. A good and fun little illustration of that is the Declaration of Independence that says, do you remember that line? I quoted it before. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That's what Mr. Jefferson wrote, but it was originally written by another guy, I can't remember who it was, um, like John Adams or someone like that, who's probably in Hamilton as well. But he had originally written, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, that all men are created equal. And then Jefferson, from, for some reason, puts a line through sacred and undeniable and writes self-evident 
instead. And that's what's now printed, as what everybody knows. But the original draft of it had a lot more religion in it. Did you hear that? So we hold these truths to be sacred, something really precious to us and, and undeniable, um, that all men are created equal. And we could say that, yes, as Christians. And then Jefferson comes along and says, hold on, we don't want this to be a religious kingdom. Um, maybe it just sounds a little bit, kind of rolls off the tongue easier as well, but we, we don't want America to be a place that we rely on God to tell us what, what we think and do and how we live. So what we'll say is, because we pretty much all agree on this anyway, because they all happen to be Protestants who come across from Europe. It seems undeniable and sacred. Yeah, of course it is, but really it's just self-evident to us that all men are created equal. So let's put that instead. And can you see that, how that's an example of like building a, king, a kingdom where people are created equal by the creator, but we don't mention the creator anymore. We don't mention that it's a sacred value that actually has roots anywhere. We just want the tree chopped off from the roots. And that's what America's been. There are lots and lots of Christians in America because it's their heritage, but written into their foundation statements are basically Christian values, but with all their Christianity taken out of them. Um, and that's basically where we are in the West at the moment, I think. It's like, um, it's what this guy talks about a lot, Tom Holland. It's what Andrew Wilson talks about a lot in this book. It's what Glenn Scrivener talks a lot about in like a shorter book that is called Echoes or something. The air we breathe. The air we breathe. Yeah, yeah. Please memory. It's called the air we breathe, and he he points out like six or seven Christian values that are our culture's values that everybody loves and would agree to and like nod strongly to, uh, but which he says our culture doesn't actually have any reason for believing those other than that we like them, and he just points out that they come from Christianity. They're not obvious and self-evident to lots of other cultures in the world, to lots of other time periods in the world. They really come from our Christian heritage, and we're very quickly cutting us, our, ourselves off from the roots, um, to the point where you, you will basically not be able to look at a tyrant in the face who says, well, we should treat these people different to those. And, and we should, we'll come along in our culture and say, no, all men are created equal. We should love the, um, the, the poor and the downtrodden. And, and someone will just say, well, why? And we don't really have a reason other than, well, that's just how we do things in our culture, but that's not a very good reason. Or, well, I just like it that way. Well, that's not a very good reason. It, it doesn't persuade any tyrant or any evil person to stop doing evil. What you really need is God, who's your judge and who's going to put everything right in the end and make you, uh, hold you accountable to everything you've done. And not just the judge. What you need is Christ. What you need is that, that God has stepped into our world to suffer and die for us. What you need is Christmas time, right? It's the incarnation. Uh, is not just something I'm saying, but Andrew Wilson, even Tom Holland, who's not a Christian, um, and, and plenty of people, back to Nietzsche, who was a major atheist, but basically spotted that we live in consistent lives in the world. That, like, we want to live by Christian values. We want, we want the kingdom, but we're not interested in the king anymore. And surely that's going to crash at some point. People are going to come up against a situation and we just won't be able to speak back to it, or have any kind of solid footing to push back against evil and darkness because we we just hold those views because we like them um, and so the only way that we're going to this is Nietzsche's thing called the, like the will to power the only way you're ever going to actually be able to persuade other people of your views is by crushing them and forcing your views upon them um, and then you get all sorts of internet stuff internet pylons on twitter and you know cancelling people um, and anti-fascist stuff and all, all of that kind of stuff is like even the orange people who, who do climate things, it's like the, the only tool in the locker is trying to force people to, to go along with your agenda um, and not persuade, persuade people anymore or, or paint a better vision of the future. It's just, it's like violence in, in speech and action. And then romantic is the last one. And that really um, is William Blake uh, and, and Coleridge, and we're kind of running, time, running out of time to get into that, that kind of stuff. But, we're not really enlightened people. What we are is like romantic people. Um, the, if the enlightenment was all about machines and about science and that kind of thing. People like Coleridge and Wordsworth, like, if you remember them from English classes, days gone by. But there were poets who came along. William Blake was one as well. Um, you can hear the kind of echoes of that in his story. The romantics come along after the enlightenment and they say, this world is really dark 
and this world that you like scientists have built is just really flat um, and there should be a lot more beauty and joy and like mystery and, and because surely the best things in life are actually mysterious and good and things that you can't just pin down in a laboratory like love and beauty and poetry and music and meaning that you can't study those things with with the senses in a like a lab of reproducible science stuff you can't do that you need poetry for that you need like relationship you need love you need beauty you need art and those kind of things to help you and what they do is just go way over the top and say like feeling is what life is all about and so you get people who go crazy for poetry or um, really into like mad art and trying to get back to like uh to a world that's full of beauty, but it's still without God, it's still without any like transcendent God who's up there, who's stepped into our world. All we're doing is trying to work the feelings up with beautiful pictures and beautiful art and try and think differently with our imaginations. Um, and what we can do in that kind of world, where we live like in the downstream river of that, like science is everywhere, but also like sentiment and romance and every Disney film is about that. And we, we sort of believe that that's what love is, that love is what the world is all about, but we also sort of believe that there is nothing else in this world except what you can taste, see, feel, and touch. This world is like a closed off box. We have these echoes in our hearts. That there must be something out there. We get a taste of it in love and music, but, but we don't have any way of actually understanding what's out there. Um, so we're enlightenment, like modern people in our education, but we're romantic people in our desires, and we don't know how to put the two together. Um, and how do you put the two together? Well, you need the one who's come from the transcendent place, who is love, like in this person. You need him to break into the world of molecules and atoms. Um, you need Christmas for, for the transcendent God who's got the whole universe in his hand, who's just beyond imagining the size of him. You need him to be contracted down <coughs> to a span, born as a little baby, made up of atoms and molecules who could cry and um, wet his nappy and suck milk and scream and suffer and be betrayed and even die for you. Um, so the, basically the key, I think, and everybody should think, um, like the key to bringing hope and joy back into the world where we are at the moment is not enlightenment just science, not just romantic escape into poetry and music and like sentiment, um, but is Jesus. Uh, is, is the one who's come from out there in the world that we intuit and that we know is there, uh, but we can't quite get a handle on with all of our science, that he has to come to us and speak to us and speak our language. And that's what Christians have to offer, is like a, a view of the world that isn't just nuts and bolts atoms and and isn't just, well, you know, believe it if you want to, if it feels good and makes you feel a little bit hopeful and forget about the misery of, of the dark night when you're left alone with your thoughts. We, we, we're not either of those people, we're both, right? We, we put the two, the two together and we say, molecules and atoms are true and everything the scientists work out, generally speaking, is probably thinking God's thoughts after him. And also, there really is. The deepest, biggest reality there is, is love incarnate. It's like love, love in himself step into our world. Um, so how does that look? Well, it looks like... Yeah. Are you getting tired? Fancy? Can you go home? Should we do one more thing? I think one more thing. Is that okay? Yes. Right, so we're actually going to use these books which Paul printed for us. Let's have a look at this. I think basically the church is the answer to... Oh, yeah. oh no, I'll open that. Have a nice picture. The blue screen is a bit annoying, isn't it? Grab your booklets. I only left mine in my other car. Do you want to share? Yeah, it might. Share like? Charlotte's. So flip page 22. That's where we are. Thank you, Squire. Um, 22. Yeah. Page 22. What, so bon, so D, this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was 19, like, killed in 1944 by the Nazis. Grew up in like really modern Germany. Um, we haven't had time this evening made time to get into like the theology of, of um, the 20th century and that kind of thing but basically it follows the enlightenment stuff so we're, we're thinking of like nuts and bolts theology where all of the supernatural stuff gets shoved to the side and what we're doing is looking through scripture to try and see the 
like the solid reality on the other side of these mysterious documents. So people start to, for a whole century pretty much, disbelieve that the Bible is a supernatural book and it's basically just a human thing. And so Bonhoeffer, is, that's a German, philosophy, uh, German theology thing, guys like Schleiermacher, um, who bring that in like 18, 1800s, 1900s. And Bonhoeffer grows up in that kind of world, like mechanical, great industrial power Germany, um, with this like mechanical theology, but grows through that into something that actually, his own theology, his own Christianity, grows into something really beautiful that ends up standing against the like nuts and bolts theology that strips out all the supernatural and ends up standing against the nuts and bolts power thing that the Nazis were into. Um, and he talks about, he's a pacifist to begin with, but he ends up talking about putting a spoke into the wheels of evil. And that's what he did. He spent his later years in life before he got arrested uh, for being part of the group that tried to assassinate Hitler. Um, he spent his life working on an underground church network and an underground like seminary that trained people for what he called the confessing church in Germany, like a church that actually believed in scripture, that actually believed in Christ. Um, and so this, is, this quote comes from a book called Life Together, which is his little manual for what community life should look like in the church, in the confessing church. You've got to think of like Nazism over the top, of people coming in with all of their nuts and bolts plans to make Christianity fit in like with the culture, to make it make sense. Um, and what he says is, the key is the incarnation that God has come close to us and that we, as the church, are God's body, right? That we are Christ's body. And he talks an awful lot, like really deeply into that. And this is one of, the, I think, like the most, uh, I remember it just blew my mind when I read it first. So can I read it to you? And then we'll try and chew it over and just, just tell me what you think about it and how, how it might apply to the church today. On new, innumerable occasions, the whole Christian community has been shattered because it has lived on the basis of a wishful image, or like a wish dream. Certainly, serious Christians who are put in a community for the first time will often bring with them a very definite image of what Christian communal life should be, and they'll be anxious to realise it. But God's grace quickly frustrates all such dreams. A great disillusionment with others, with Christians in general, and if we're fortunate with ourselves, is bound to overwhelm us, as surely as God desires to lead us to an understanding of genuine Christian community. You see what he's getting at? Right, like, we come to a church and we have all our ideas of what a church should be like. And if God's gracious to us, he'll wreck all those ideas and make us very frustrated that our plans aren't coming to fruition. Okay. Um, by sheer grace, God will not permit us to live in a dream world, even for a, a, for a few weeks, and to abandon ourselves to those blissful experiences and exalted moods that sweep over us like a wave of rapture. For God is not a God of emotionalism, not just a romantic, but the God of truth. Only that community which enters into the experience of this great disillusionment will, with all its unpleasant and evil appearances, begins to be what it should be in God's sight, begins to grasp in faith the promise that's given to it. The sooner this moment of disillusionment comes over the individual and the community, the better for both. God hates this wishful dreaming because it makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. Those who dream of this idealized community demand that it be fulfilled by God, by others, and by themselves. They enter the community of Christians with their demands, set up their own law, and judge one another, and even God accordingly. They stand adamant, a living reproach to all others in the circle of community. They act as if they have to create the Christian community, as if their visionary ideal binds the people together. Whatever doesn't go their way, they call a failure. When their idealized image is shattered, they see the community break into pieces, so they first become accusers of other Christians in the community, then accusers of God, and finally, the despairing accusers of themselves, because God already has laid the only foundation of our community, because God has united us in one body with other Christians in Jesus Christ long before we entered into community life with them. We enter into that life together with other Christians, not as those who make demands, but as those who thankfully receive. What do you make, what do you make of that? It makes sense. Yeah. Like it, it's what you see, isn't it? It's like when you bring. Yeah. I mean, this is true that you wrote it as mm. now, isn't it? You bring your ideas and try and. I'm thinking of even my background was my church. They 
their view of things was right and mm -hmm. everyone else's was wrong and yeah. they needed to conform to us. To yeah. that. And we didn't work with anyone else because we yeah. were right and they were wrong and that one thing makes think how much better. Yeah. Like the number of churches that we could have worked with, we chose not to. Yeah. How much more that could have benefited the town. Yeah. If we had said actually, you know, we all follow Christ, mm -hmm. we all believe the Bible. Yeah. So let's share that. Yeah. I grew up in a church like that as well. And, and so they're like accused they become accusers of other Christians. Yeah. And like there's a really shocking thing and then they become accusers of God and like they get dis despairing frustrated with God that he's not doing what he's not bringing revival or something like that and then finally they're just like well it must be me and they just don't bother with church anymore just disappear but that's a can you see that that's a very modern thing that like it's individualism like on a church level or on my level bringing this to the church and saying you have to be like this because what I think is right and I am the individual and I must and it's also like a lack of authority so I don't come under the authority of the church leaders or of God. I'm the authority who's over other Christians telling them what to do to fit my system. I'm under, I'm even over God. And eventually I'm so miserable, I just end up in despair. Um, and it's, it's like a toxic mix of romanticism. I think the church should be like this. And nuts and bolts, enlightenment, like modern. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the church isn't something I receive. It's something that I create with my ideas. It's a human thing. It's not a vision that I receive. It's something that I've dreamed up and I impose on other people um, and blame them if they don't fit. Yeah, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, just thinking about the How would you, how would, how would you go, because we're not in a church such as what he mentions, are we really, even as much as we are different, opinion, mm. we're not like that, if we're honest. How would you go back to that before, how would you get to that church, global, universal, whatever, yeah. without heresy, without infighting? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, without there being ultimately whoever makes it some decisions yeah. because we are in a democratic world. Yeah. Their viewpoint. Yeah. Bias in the whole I think that's still an open question. It's like we haven't since what's the story, in other words, telling the story from Protestant Reformation is like split, 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 <laughs> split. It's just like fracturing and splintering. And so no, nobody's really put it together. But I reckon like he, just in the end of it, what does he say? Um, God already has laid the, the only foundation for our community as he's united us in one body with other Christians in Jesus Christ long before we entered into common life with them. So even before you join the church, you're already in the church. Uh, like even before you're, you get your structures right and we finally can live in unity together, it's probably to be honest that maybe the new creation before we actually get it right. Um, but God has already made us un united. And so there's... There needs to be more an element of like receiving it somehow, whatever that looks like, than trying to force it and make it, make it happen. Um, yeah, and, and the other thoughts, like how do we do? How do we try and recognize what God has given us and receive it as his body and like serve in it and, and be humble rather than come to it with our, with our modern tools and our like great desires for ex big experiences in our and end up crushed and disappointed. How do we how do we do better than our previous generations? I like that bit about a great disillusionment. And if we're fortunate, a disillusionment of ourselves. Okay. And that, yeah. that, um, because it's easy to be dis disillusioned with other people. Yeah. But when you are disillusioned with yourself, yeah. then you can see that we're all just the same, yeah. but it's only God that, yeah. that isn't like that. Yeah. And it's put everything into its perspective. Yeah. yeah, I think you have to go back to Christ then. Mm -hmm. So he's a Lutheran, and that's basically what, he's getting back to what Luther was teaching in the beginning. Like you have to get to the end of yourself to realize that even all the good stuff about you is, you know, my righteousness is filthy rags. So all my hope is in Christ 
So you need the disillusionment. Yeah. You, you need uh, in yourself and in others. So when people come and say, oh, you know, 20% are, are doing 80% of the work again, it's so frustrating. Um, that should be something that, like it's, it's right to be frustrated by that in a way, isn't it? But should, should somehow get us to go back to Christ and say, Lord, would you help me receive these people? Yeah. Because you love them, you've died for them. So they must be here for a reason. Help me not to just try and get their diaries busy or just try and force their behavior into to something by um, some way to go back to Christ. If you think you're disappointed with somebody else, yeah. you go to think, well, how am I disappointing other people? Mm-hmm. And then it's back to Jesus to change that. Yeah. How do it yeah. yeah, I think that's right. Uh, and it's in his time. Yeah. Um, so you, so you, you need some humility then. People's hearts, hearts aren't changed by nuts and bolts and like getting our social structures right in the modern enlightenment way. <clears throat> and they're not just changed by having awesome experiences of smoke machines and worship music and prayer retreats and that kind of thing. But they're changed by Christ in his timing. And so I, th- I think it's a very hard thing to do when I can find out almost any information I want right now by going to my tools in my phone, in my pocket, my computer, and I can shape the world around me however I want. I can paint my house whatever I want, I can live pretty much whatever, wherever I want in the world, I could get a new job, you know, uh, and, sh- and shape my reality as I want to. So it's really hard for us, for people like that, who've grown up in a world like this, to come to him and receive the, work, the church as it is, rather than try and like, force it into our will, democratize it into our will. Buy, it, buy our way into it, um, be superior about it because we're you know, the, the developed West and, and learn nothing from the others. Uh, make it into just a machine for, for converts um, and a, a place where we don't think at all about our history. We're kind of almost ex-Christian and we're just getting into our own, whatever feels best for me, whatever makes me feel closest to Christ, then that's basically what Christianity is. Um, I, I found this a little bit scary studying this stuff and realizing that even people who I think of as old, like I don't know, my in-laws, grandparents era, they're really modern and like very Western <laughs> and this as well. Um, and we're, we're trying to push, you know, trying as a church to move away from the traditional way of doing church and do things differently and speak to the culture in the way that, the way that we do it. Um, but we've got to be careful that we don't just become like our culture and have a church that's nothing like the Christian church as it as it's given to us by God, but it just becomes like a product of our own intuitions, which we think are obvious and self-evident, but actually they really are a product of our culture. Um, I think we should finish there. Um, I haven't really mentioned anything about the Welsh connection, or like Welsh revival, how we <clears throat> see in this chapel, you know, with these buildings, like what's happened in Wales, um, partly intentionally because there's a little video film thing that's come out Jonathan Thomas, the previous mm-hmm. pastor here called Welsh Awakenings which as we have like cinema stuff in here, I thought it might be fun for us to get a copy of that and watch it together and, and he'll do a way better job in you know, the hour of the film whatever it is, than we could do in 10-15 minutes looking at Welsh revivals um, so if you, if you fancy it maybe we'll do that in the new year and like, get a, come and think about revivals in our local history, do that as a session um, but let me, yeah, let me give you a couple of books, things to look at. This is Tom Holland's. This looks like a big, heavy academic book. He's actually a really fun historian, writing about how the West was, it's called The Making of the Western Mind, which is basically about Christianity. This is a good one about science. So can science explain everything? Like if you live in that world, if you've got kids, especially coming back from home from school, talking about evolution, it's, you know, there's obviously no God because we know how the world works. Uh, this is John Lennox. It's a really good one. You can borrow any of these if you want. This is a good one about what I was talking about, like bridging the gap between roman- romance, romanticism, and enlightenment, like the, the transcendent world and the imminent you know, world of molecules. Uh, it's by a poet, a guy called Malcolm Guide. He does, he, who just quotes poetry and has loads of artworks and stuff. It's a really amazing book. Um, just really good to, and, and 
He's big on how Jesus is the one who stands in the middle of history, joining everything together and making everything make sense. He's big on talking pipes. Yeah, and he's, a, he's amazing. Waistcoats. Yes. Watch his YouTube video, he has a massive beard. Yeah. It's like, looks like Father Christmas. It's really cool. And this is really good. Um, and if you're not into reading, it's called make, Remaking the World. Andrew Wilson and Glenn Scrivener, the guy I mentioned before. Um, is your favourite? Same chat. That's the same. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Yeah. Uh, they have a podcast that's just been released. They're on their like sixth, seventh episode called Post Christianity? Question uh, mark. And the two of them just talk about all this kind of stuff, like how do we get to where we are? They interview a few interesting people on like the sexual revolution or like philosophy, um, and talk a lot about how we should live. So he's a pastor. Glenn Scrivener is an evangelist. They work with like normal people every day, um, and and so talk about history and bring it into how should that shape how we live life in the church. Today. It's horrible. Yeah, should we pray? Yeah, would a couple of us be willing to pray? And uh, Sammy, you can close in a couple of minutes. Lord, we thank you for um, your faithfulness to the church over many years. We're we'll sorry for how we so often, uh, and it's happened in every generation, just drifted along with our culture and not seen things that we should have seen. Lord, we haven't talked about slavery this evening and what a um, horror that was, um, something that was signed off by and even celebrated by plenty of Christians in the past um, who were just blind to it. Uh, and yet plenty of other Christians, Lord, who stood up and who spoke truth and grace um, and did wonderful work in their communities and in the world to to free people and to bring righteousness and, and justice. Lord, help us to see, uh, that's one thing that's really useful about studying history is to help us see where we really are at the moment. So Lord, we pray that you'd help us to see ourselves um, and not despair about that, but Lord, as we, as we do get disillusioned with who we are and what we've become, even with our own church and with each other, um, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to look to you in hope and know that as you've been faithful to and brought every generation, um, brought through every generation, uh, a church that, um, that is faithful to you and that uh, that somehow is able to keep the gospel pure and pass it on to the next. Lord, we pray that you would make us like those people who stood before us and passed it down faithfully to us. Lord, we pray that you would help us with all these new challenges that we face in the post-Christian world. Help us to know how to be faithful to you, Lord, how to hold on to grace, how to uh, cling to you and, and know the freedom that there is in the gospel rather than, um, than the bondage that there is in so much of the stuff that our world goes after. Lord, help us to be convinced about the truth and not be wobbly on that, but to, um, to know who you are and what you've done for us and who we are in you and what we should do in the future. Lord, help us to be people who have really deep convictions, who are full of your love and full of grace um, and pass that on to those around us in a world that is really losing its bearings. Lord, we pray that you help us um, to be clear-headed, to understand uh, where we are and who you are and where we should be going next. And uh, Lord, lead us, we pray in our families, in our conversations with people next to us on the bus or in the streets or in our workplaces. We pray that you help us just to be faithful to you, um, to do a good job of passing on the good news to the next generation, Lord, that people might come to know, that, to know you for themselves and receive all that you've given to us in Christ.